From the Conference Center at Temple Square in Salt Lake City, we bring you the General Priesthood Session of the 188th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Music for this session is provided by a priesthood choir from Brigham Young University, Idaho. President Henry B. Eyring, second counselor in the First Presidency of the Church, will conduct this session. Brethren, we welcome you to the priesthood session of the 188th Annual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Russell M. Nelson, who presides at the conference, has asked me to conduct this session. These services are being relayed by satellite transmission to priesthood holders in many locations throughout the world. The music for this session will be provided by a priesthood choir from Brigham Young University, Idaho, under the direction of Randall Kempton, Paul Busselberg, and David Lozano Torres, with Brian Mathias and Andrew Unsworth at the organ. The choir will open this meeting by singing, How Firm a Foundation. The invocation will then be offered by Brother M. Joseph Bruff, second counselor in the Young Men General Presidency, after which the choir will sing, Father in Heaven.
our loving and righteous Heavenly Father, we gather the body of thy priesthood to give thee thanks. We thank thee most of all for sending thy Son and the plan that allows us to return to thee. We are grateful to be holders of thy priesthood. We're grateful to be of service to thee. We are grateful to have a prophet, President Nelson, and a first presidency in a quorum of the twelve, and the mantle that's upon them to be prophets, seers, and revelators. We pray, Father, that thy spirit will be with us this day, that we'll have ears to hear and hearts that will be prepared to receive, that we may be about thy work and receive instruction with a desire to change. We ask thee, Father, also to bless our wonderful other half that's not with us. Bless our sisters, our mothers, our grandmothers, our daughters, and bless our wonderful missionaries throughout the world. Again, we pray that thy Holy Spirit will guide our hearts, and this we do in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
We will now be pleased to hear from Brother Douglas D. Holmes, first counselor in the Young Men General Presidency. He will be followed briefly by our prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. We will then hear from Elders D. Todd Christofferson and Ronald A. Rasband of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Brethren, it is a privilege to be with you in this historic conference. When I was a new mission president, I was excited to receive our first group of new missionaries. A few of our more experienced missionaries were preparing for a brief meeting with them. I noticed that they had arranged children's chairs in a semi semicircle. What's up with the little chairs, I asked. The missionary somewhat sheepishly said, for the new missionaries. I believe the way we see others significantly impacts their perception of who they are and what they can become. Our new missionaries sat on adult chairs that day. Sometimes I fear we figuratively give our young men of the Aaronic Priesthood children's chairs to sit on, rather than helping them see that God has given them a sacred trust and a vital work to do. President Thomas S. Monson counseled us that young men need to understand what it means to be bearers of the priesthood of God. They need to be guided to a spiritual awareness of the sacredness of their ordained calling. Today, I pray the Holy Ghost will guide us to a greater understanding of the power and sacredness of the Aaronic Priesthood and inspire us to focus more diligently on our priesthood duties. My message is for all Aaronic priesthood holders, including those who also hold the Melchizedek priesthood. Elder Dale G. Renlund taught that the purpose of the priesthood is to provide God's children access to the atoning power of Jesus Christ. To receive Christ's atoning power in our lives, we must believe in Him, repent of our sins, make and keep sacred covenants through ordinances, and receive the Holy Ghost. These are not principles we engage in just once. Rather, they work together, reinforcing and building on each other in a continuing process of upward progression to come unto Christ and be perfected in Him. So what is the role of the Aaronic Priesthood in this? How does it help us gain access to Christ's atoning power? I believe the answer lies in the keys of the Aaronic Priesthood, the keys of the ministering of angels and of the preparatory gospel. Let's begin with one aspect of the ministering of angels. Before God's children can have faith in Jesus Christ, they need to know Him and be taught His gospel. As the Apostle Paul said, how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. From the beginning of time, God has sent angels to minister unto the children of men to make manifest the coming of Christ. Angels are heavenly beings bearing God's message. In both Hebrew and Greek, the root word of angel is messenger. In much the same way that angels are authorized messengers sent by God to declare His word and thereby build faith, we who hold the Aaronic Priesthood have been ordained to teach and invite all to come unto Christ. To preach the gospel is a priesthood duty, and the power associated with this duty is not just for prophets or even just for missionaries. It is for you. So how do we get this power? How does a 12-year-old deacon or any of us bring faith in Christ to the hearts of God's children? We start by treasuring up His Word, so its power is within us. He has promised that if we do, we will have the power of God unto the convincing of men. It may be an opportunity to teach at a core meeting or visit the home of a member. 
It may be something less formal, like a conversation with a friend or a family member. In any of these settings, if we have prepared, we can teach the gospel the way angels do, by the power of the Holy Ghost. I recently heard Jacob, an Aaronic priesthood holder in Papua New Guinea, testify of the power of the Book of Mormon and how it has helped him resist evil and follow the Spirit. His words increased my faith and the faith of others. My faith has also grown as I have heard Aaronic priesthood holders teach and testify in their core meeting. Young men, you are authorized messengers. Through your words and actions, you can bring faith in Christ to the hearts of God's children. As President Russell M. Nelson said, to them you will be as a ministering angel. Increased faith in Christ always leads to a desire to change or repent. So it is logical that the key of the ministering of angels would be accompanied by the key of the preparatory gospel, the gospel of repentance and a baptism and the remission of sins. As you study your ironic priesthood duties, you will see a clear charge to invite others to repent and improve. That does not mean we stand on street corners shouting, repent ye. More often, it means that we repent, we forgive. And as we minister to others, we offer the hope and repent that repentance brings because we have experienced it ourselves. I've been with Aaronic priesthood holders as they visited fellow corn members. I have witnessed their care soften hearts and help their brothers feel God's love. I heard one young man bear testimony to his peers of the power of repentance. As he did, hearts were softened, commitments were made, and the healing power of Christ was felt. President Gordon B. Hinckley taught, it is one thing to repent it is another to have our sins remitted or forgiven. The power to bring this about is found in the Aaronic Priesthood. The Aaronic Priesthood ordinances of baptism and the sac sacrament witness and complete our repentance for a remission of sins. President Dallin H. Oaks explained it this way. We are commanded to repent of our sins and come to the Lord with a broken heart and a contrite spirit and partake of the sacrament. When we renew our baptismal covenants in this way, the Lord renews the cleansing effect of our baptism. Brethren, it is a sacred and holy privilege to administer ordinances that bring a remission of sins to repentant hearts. I was recently told of a priest who struggles to express himself blessing the sacrament for the first time. As he did, a powerful spirit came over him and the congregation. Later in the meeting, he bore a simple but clear testimony of the power he, of God that he felt during that ordinance. In Sydney, Australia, four members of a priest quorum baptized members of the Boilongo family. The mother of one of these priests related to me how this experience powerfully impacted her son. These priests came to understand what it means to be commissioned of Jesus Christ. As you know, priests can now officiate in performing proxy baptisms in the temple. My 17-year-old son recently baptized me for some of our ancestors. We both felt deep gratitude for the Aaronic priesthood and the privilege of acting for the salvation of God's children. Young men, as you diligently engage in your priesthood duties, you participate with God in his work to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Experiences like these increase your desire and prepare you to teach repentance and baptize converts as missionaries. They also prepare you for lifelong service in the Melchizedek Priesthood. Aaronic priesthood holders, we have the privilege and duty to be fellow servants with John the Baptist. John was sent as an authorized messenger to bear witness of Christ and invite all to repent and be baptized. That is, he exercised the Aaronic priesthood keys we have discussed. John then declared, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, 
but he that cometh after me is mightier than I. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Thus the Aaronic priesthood with the keys of the ministering of angels and the preparatory gospel prepare the way for God's children to receive through the Melchizedek priesthood the gift of the Holy Ghost, the greatest gift we can receive in this life. What a profound responsibility God has given to Aaronic priesthood holders. Parents and priesthood leaders, can you sense the importance of President Monson's counsel to help young men understand what it means to be bearers of the priesthood of God? Understanding and magnifying the Aaronic priesthood will prepare them to be faithful Melchizedek priesthood holders, power-filled missionaries, and righteous husbands and fathers. Through their service, they will understand and feel the reality of priesthood power, the power to act in the name of Christ for the salvation of God's children. Young men, God has a work for you to do. Your ironic priesthood ordination is central to helping his children receive Christ's atoning power. I promise, as you put these sacred duties at the center of your life, you will feel the power of God as never before. You will understand your identity as a son of God, called with a holy calling to do his work. And like John the Baptist, you will help prepare the way for the coming of his son. Of these truths, I bear witness in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Brother Holmes, for your important message. Dear brethren, we deeply miss President Thomas S. Monson and Elder Robert D. Hales, yet we all press on in the work of the Lord. I am very grateful for each man who bears the holy priesthood. You are the hope of our Redeemer who desires that every man might speak in the name of God the Lord, even the Savior of the world. He wants all of his ordained sons to represent him, to speak for him, to act for him, and bless the lives of God's children throughout the world to the end that faith also might increase in all the earth. Some of you serve where the Church has been established for generations. Others serve where the Church is relatively new. For some, your wards are large. For others, your branches are small and distances are great. Regardless of your individual circumstances, each of you is a member of a priesthood quorum with a divine mandate to learn and to teach, to love and to serve others. Tonight, we announce a significant restructuring of our Melchizedek priesthood quorums to accomplish the work of the Lord more effectively. In each ward, the high priests and the elders will now be combined into one elders quorum. This adjustment will greatly enhance the capacity and the ability of men who bear the priesthood to serve others. Prospective elders will be welcomed in and fellowshiped by that quorum. In each stake, the stake presidency will continue to preside over the stake high priest quorum, but the composition of that quorum will be based on current priesthood callings, as will be explained later. Elder D. Todd Christofferson and Elder Ronald A. Rasband of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles will now teach us more about these important adjustments. These modifications have been under study for many months. We have felt a pressing need to improve the way we care for our members and report our contacts with them. To do that better, we need to strengthen our priesthood quorums to give greater direction to the ministering of love and support that the Lord intends for his saints. These adjustments are inspired of the Lord. 
As we implement them, we will be even more effective than we have ever been previously. We are engaged in the work of Almighty God. Jesus is the Christ. We are his humble servants. God bless you, brethren, as we learn of and do our duty. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Not long after the church was organized in this last dispensation, the Lord stated in a revelation, and by the prayer of your faith ye shall receive my law, that ye may know how to govern my church and have all things right before me. This principle has been followed in the church, and that promise has been honored by the Lord ever since. Patterns for priesthood organization and service have been revealed from time to time, beginning with the prophet Joseph Smith, when priesthood offices and quorums were first established. Significant refinements were revealed and implemented during the tenure of Presidents Brigham Young, John Taylor, and Spencer W. Kimball, among others. With respect to the Quorum of the Twelve and the Seventy, high priests and other officers and quorums in both the Melchizedek and Aaronic priesthoods. Now, in a historic statement just moments ago, President Russell M. Nelson announced a further crucial adjustment. If I may repeat some of his statement, quoting, Tonight we announce a significant restructuring of our Melchizedek priesthood quorums to accomplish the work of the Lord more effectively. In each ward, the high priests and the elders will now be combined into one elders quorum, and the composition of the stake high priests quorum will be based on current priesthood callings. President Nelson added, these modifications have been under study for many months. We have felt a pressing need to improve the way we care for our members. To do that better, we need to strengthen our priesthood quorums, to give greater direction to the ministering of love and support that the Lord intends for His saints. These adjustments are inspired of the Lord. As we implement them, we will be even more effective than we've been previously. At the First Presidency's direction, Elder Ronald A. Rasband and I will add some detail that we trust will respond to questions you may have. First, to reiterate, what are the adjustments for ward high priest groups and elders' quorums? In wards, members of elders' quorums and high priest groups will now be combined into one Melchizedek priesthood quorum with one quorum presidency. This quorum, increased in numbers and unity, will be designated the elders' quorum. High priest groups are discontinued. The elders' quorum includes all elders and prospective elders in the ward, as well as high priests who are not currently serving in the bishopric, in the stake presidency, on the high council, or as functioning patriarchs. The high priest quorum in the stake will be composed of those high priests who are serving in the stake presidency, in bishoprics, on the high council, and as functioning patriarchs. How is the presidency of the Elders Quorum to be organized? The stake presidency will release current high priest group leaderships and Elders Quorum presidencies and will call a new Elders Quorum president and counselors in each ward. The new Elders Quorum presidency may include elders and high priests of varying ages and experience serving together in one quorum presidency. An elder or a high priest may serve as the quorum president or as a counselor in the presidency. This is not a takeover of elders' quorums by high priests. <laughs> we expect elders and high priests to work together in any combination in the quorum presidency and in quorum service. These quorum adjustments should be implemented as soon as conveniently possible. 
Does this adjustment in quorum structure change the priesthood office held by quorum members? No. This action does not rescind any priesthood office to which any quorum member may have been ordained in the past. As you know, a man may be ordained to different priesthood offices over his lifetime, and he does not lose or forfeit any prior ordination when he receives a new one. While in some instances a priesthood bearer may serve in more than one office at a time, as when a high priest also serves as a patriarch or as a bishop, he typically does not function in all his priesthood offices at the same time. Bishops in seventies, for instance, do not actively serve in those offices once they're released or made emeritus. Thus, whatever other priesthood office or offices a man may hold, while he is a member of the elders' quorum, he serves as an elder. Years ago, President Boyd K. Packer observed that the priesthood is greater than any of its offices. The priesthood is not divisible. An elder holds as much priesthood as an apostle. When a man has the priesthood conferred upon him, he receives all of it. However, there are offices within the priesthood, divisions of authority and responsibility. Sometimes one office is spoken of as being higher or lower than another office. Rather than higher or lower, offices in the Melchizedek priesthood represent different areas of service. Brother and I devoutly hope that we will no longer speak in terms of being advanced to another office in the Melchizedek priesthood. Elders will continue to be ordained high priests when they are called to a stake presidency, high council, or bishopric or at other times, as determined by the stake president, through prayerful consideration and inspiration. When their terms of service in a stake presidency, high council, or bishopric are completed, high priests will rejoin the elders' quorum in their ward. Who directs the work of the elders' quorum president? The stake president presides over the Melchizedek priesthood in his stake. Therefore, the elders quorum president is directly responsible to the stake president, who provides training and guidance from the stake presidency and through the high council. The bishop, as the presiding high priest in the ward, also meets regularly with the elders quorum president. The bishop counsels with him, gives appropriate direction regarding how best to serve and bless ward members, working in harmony with all ward organizations. What are the purposes of the adjustments to Melchizedek Priesthood Quorums? Having one Melchizedek Priesthood Quorum in a ward unifies priesthood holders to accomplish all aspects of the work of salvation, including the temple and family history work previously coordinated by the high priest groups. It allows quorum members of all ages and backgrounds to benefit from the perspective and experience of one another and those in different stages of life. It also provides additional opportunities for experienced priesthood holders to mentor others, including prospective elders, new members, young adults, and those returning to church activity. I cannot adequately express how excited I am to contemplate the increasingly vital role that elders' quorums will play in the future. The wisdom, experience, capacity, and strength that will be found in these quorums portend a new day and a new standard of priesthood service across the Church. Twenty years ago in General Conference, I related a story first told by Elder Von J. Featherstone of the Seventy that I believe bears repeating here. In 1918, Brother George Goetz was a farmer who raised sugar beets in Lehigh, Utah. Winter came early that year and froze much of his beet crop in the ground. For George and his young son, Francis, 
The harvest was slow and difficult. Meanwhile, an influenza epidemic was raging. The dreaded disease claimed the lives of George's son, Charles, and three of Charles' small children, two little girls and a boy. In the course of only six days, a grieving George Goats made three separate trips to Ogden, Utah, to bring the bodies home for burial. At the end of this terrible interlude, George and Francis hitched up their wagon and headed back to the beet field. On the way, they passed wagon after wagon load of beets being hauled to the factory, driven by neighborhood farmers. As they passed by, each driver would wave a greeting, Hiya, Uncle George. Sure sorry, George. Tough break, George. You've got a lot of friends, George. On the last wagon was freckle-faced Jasper Rolf. He waved a cheery greeting and called out, That's all of them, Uncle George. Brother Goats turned to Francis and said, I wish it was all of ours. When they arrived at the farm gate, Francis jumped down off the big red beet wagon and opened the gate as his father drove onto the field. George pulled up, stopped the team, and scanned the field. There wasn't a sugar beet in the whole field. Then it dawned on him what Jasper Rolf meant when he called out, that's all of them, Uncle George. George got down off the wagon, picked up a handful of the rich brown soil he loved so much, and then a beet top, and he looked for a moment at these symbols of his labor as if he couldn't believe his eyes. Then he sat down on a pile of beet tops. This man, who had brought four of his loved ones home for burial in the course of only six days, made caskets, dug graves, and even helped with the burial clothing. This amazing man, who had never faltered nor flinched nor wavered throughout this organizing ordeal, sat down, sat down on a pile of beet tops and sobbed like a little child. Then he arose and wiped his eyes, looked up at the sky, and said, Thanks, Father, for the elders of our ward. Yes, thanks be to God for the men of the priesthood and for the service they will yet render in lifting individuals and families and in establishing Zion. The First Presidency, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and the Presidency of the Seventy have considered these adjustments over an extended period of time. With much prayer, careful study of the scriptural foundation of priesthood quorums, and confirmation that this is the Lord's will, we are moving forward with unanimity in what is in reality one more step in the unfolding of the Restoration. The Lord's direction is manifest, and I rejoice in it as I bear witness of Him, His priesthood, and your ordinations in that priesthood. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. <clears throat> My beloved brethren of the priesthood, it is with great humility that I stand before you on this historic occasion under assignment by our dear prophet and president, Russell M. Nelson. How I love and sustain this wonderful man of God and our new First Presidency. I add my witness to that of Elder D. Todd Christofferson and my other brethren of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles that the changes announced this evening are the will of the Lord. As stated by President Nelson, this is a matter that has been prayerfully discussed and considered by the senior brethren of the Church for a long time. The desire was to seek the Lord's will and strengthen the quorums of the Melchizedek Priesthood. Inspiration was received, and this evening our Prophet made known the will of the Lord. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but He revealeth His secret unto His servants the Prophets. How blessed we are to have a living prophet today. 
Throughout our life, Sister Rasband and I have traveled the world on various church and professional assignments. I have seen nearly every type of unit configuration in the Church. A small branch in Russia where the number of Melchizedek priesthood could be counted on one hand. A new and growing ward in Africa where both high priests and elders met as a single body because the overall number of Melchizedek priesthood holders was low. And well-established wards where the number of elders required the dividing of their quorum into two quorums. Everywhere we have gone, we have witnessed the hand of the Lord going before His servants, preparing the people and the way ahead so that all His children might be blessed according to their every need. Hasn't He promised that He will go before our face and be on our right hand and on our left and that His Spirit shall be in your hearts and His angels round about, round about us? Thinking about all of you, I am reminded of the hymn, Behold a Royal Army. Behold a royal army with banner, sword, and shield is marching forth to conquer on life's great battlefield. Its ranks are filled with soldiers, united, bold, and strong, who follow their commander and sing their joyful song. Elder Christofferson has answered several questions that are certain to arise from the announcement that high priest groups and elders quorums at the ward level are being combined into one unified, mighty army of Brethren of the Melchizedek Priesthood. These adjustments will help elders quorums and relief societies harmonize their work. They will also simplify the quorum's coordination and the bishopric and ward council, and they allow the bishop to delegate more responsibilities to the elders' quorum and relief society presidents so that the bishop and his counselors can focus on their primary duties, particularly pre presiding over the young women and the young men who bear the Aaronic priesthood. Changes in organization and functions of the Church are not uncommon. In 1883, the Lord said to President John Taylor, quote, Concerning the management and organization of my Church and priesthood, I will reveal unto you from time to time, through the channels that I have appointed, everything that shall be necessary for the future development and perfection of my Church, for the adjustment and rolling forth of my kingdom." End quote. Now a few words to you, brethren, who are high priests. Know that we love you. Our Father in Heaven loves you. You are a great part of the royal army of the priesthood, and we cannot move this work forward without your goodness, service, experience, and righteousness. Alma taught that men are called to be high priests because of their exceeding faith and good works to teach and to minister to others. That experience is needed now, perhaps more than ever. In many wards, we may have high priests who are now going to have the opportunity to be presided over by an elder as their quorum president. We have a precedent of elders presiding over high priests. Elders are currently serving as branch presidents in some regions of the world where high priests reside in the branch, and there are branches in which only an elders' quorum is organized and high priests are present. What a joy it will be for all Melchizedek priesthood holders to have the blessing of teaching, learning, and serving shoulder to shoulder with all the members in their ward. Wherever you are and whatever your circumstances may be, we invite you prayerfully, faithfully, and joyfully to accept new opportunities to lead or to be led and to serve unitedly as a body of priesthood brethren. I will now address additional matters which may need clarification as we move forward to implement the will of the Lord regarding the organization of His quorums of the Holy Priesthood. 
What are the adjustments for a stake high priest quorum? Stake high priest quorums will continue to function. Stake presidencies will continue to serve as the presidency of the stake high priest quorum. However, as noted by Elder Christofferson, members of the stake high priest quorum will now consist of high priests currently serving in the stake presidency, as members of a ward bishopric, as members of the stake high council, and the functioning patriarch. Ward and stake clerks and executive secretaries are not members of the stake high priest quorum. When someone who is actively serving as a high priest, patriarch, seventy, or apostle is visiting a ward and desires to attend priesthood meeting, he will meet with the elders quorum. As brethren and these callings are released in due course, they will return to their home units as members of the elders quorum. What is the role of the stake high priest quorum? The stake presidency meets with members of the high priest quorum to counsel together, to testify, and to provide training. Stake meetings, as outlined in our handbooks, will continue with two adjustments. One, wards and stakes will no longer hold priesthood executive committee meetings. If a special ward issue arises, such as a delicate family matter or an unusual welfare challenge, it could be addressed in an expanded bishopric meeting. Other less sensitive matters can be addressed in the ward council. What has been known as the stake priesthood executive committee meeting will now be called the high council meeting. Two, the annual meeting of all ordained high priests in the stake will no longer be held. However, the stake presidency will continue to hold an annual meeting of the stake high priest quorum as it has been announced today. Can a ward have more than one elders quorum? The answer is yes. In the spirit of Doctrine and Covenants, section 107, verse 89, when a ward has an unusually large number of active Melchizedek priesthood bearers, leaders may organize more than one elders quorum. In such cases, each quorum should have a reasonable balance in terms of age, experience, and priesthood office and strength. I testify that as we move forward with this inspired quorum restructuring in our wards and stakes, that we will see a multitude of blessings. Let me cite just a few examples. Under the direction of the bishop, more priesthood resources may assist with the work of salvation. This would include the gathering of Israel through temple and family history work, working with families and individuals in need, and helping the missionaries to bring souls to Jesus Christ. As previous presiding leaders return to share their experience with the Quorum of Elders, a stronger Quorum membership will result. There will be a greater diversity of gifts and capacities within the Quorum. There will be more flexibility and availability to meet current and urgent needs within the Ward and Quorum and in fulfilling our various ministering assignments. There will be an increase in mentoring and unanimity as a new elder and an experienced high priest share experiences side by side in quorum meetings and assignments. Bishops and branch presidents would hopefully be liberated to magnify their callings, to shepherd their flocks, and to minister to those in need. We understand that each ward and stake is different. While understanding these differences, we are hopeful that you will follow through with these changes promptly following this general conference. We have been given direction by a prophet of God. What a tremendous blessing and responsibility. Let us fulfill it with all righteousness and diligence. I remind you, priesthood authority comes by way of setting apart and ordination. But real priesthood power, the power to act in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, can come only 
through righteous living. The Lord declared to the prophet Joseph Smith, the prophet of the Restoration, Behold and lo, I will take care of your flocks and will raise up elders and send unto them. Behold, I will hasten my work in its time. Indeed, this is a time when the Lord is hastening his work. Let us each use this opportunity to reflect and improve our lives, to better align with his will, so that we may deserve the many blessings he has promised to the true and faithful. Brethren, thank you for all that you're doing to be, to be a part of this magnificent work. May we go forward in this great and honored cause. O oh, when the war is ended, when strife and conflict cease, when all are safely gathered within the veil of peace, before the King Eternal, that vast and mighty throng shall praise his name forever, and this shall be their song. Victory, victory through him that redeemed us. Victory, victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Victory, victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Today, we all stand as witnesses of the Lord revealing His will through His prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. I testify that He is God's prophet here on earth. I bear my witness of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our great Redeemer and Savior. This is His work, and this is His will, to which I bear solemn testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The congregation will now join the choir in singing praise to the Lord the Almighty. It will then be my privilege to address you, President Dallin H. Oaks, First Counselor in the First Presidency, will then speak to us.
My beloved brethren, I am grateful for the privilege of speaking to you in this historic General Conference. We have sustained President Russell M. Nelson as the 17th President of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as I have had the blessing of working with him each day. I have felt a confirmation of the Spirit that President Nelson is called of God to lead the Lord's true Church. It is also my witness that the Lord has called Elder Gong and Elder Suarez to serve as members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. I love and sustain them. They will, by their ministry, bless lives across the world and across generations. This conference is historic for yet another reason. President Nelson has announced an inspired step forward in the Lord's organized plan for His Church. That plan includes a new structure for priesthood quorums in wards and stakes so that we may better fulfill our priesthood responsibilities. Those responsibilities all have to do with our priesthood care of our Father's children. The Lord's plan for His saints to provide loving care has taken many forms over the years. In the early days of Nauvoo, the Prophet Joseph Smith needed an organized way to care for the flood of largely impoverished converts coming into the city. Four of my great-grandparents were among them, the Irings, Benyons, Romneys, and Smiths. The Prophet organized the care of those saints by geography. In Illinois, those divisions of the city were called wards. As the saints moved across the plains, their care for each other was organized in companies. One of my paternal great-grandfathers was returning from his mission in what, was, what is now Oklahoma when he met a company on the trail. He was so weak with disease that he and his companion were on their backs in a little wagon. The leader of the company sent two young women to help whoever might be in that forlorn wagon. One of them, a young sister who had been converted in Switzerland, took a look at one of the missionaries and felt compassion. He was saved by that company of saints. He recovered enough to walk the rest of the way to Salt, the Salt Lake Valley with the young rescuer by his side. They fell in love and married. He became my great-grandfather, Henry Eyring, and she my great-grandmother, Maria Bomoli Eyring. Years later, when people remarked at the great difficulty of moving across a continent, she said, oh no, it wasn't hard. Well, we walked. We talked the whole way about what a miracle it was that we had both found the, the true gospel of Jesus Christ. It was the happiest time I can remember. Since the, then, the Lord has used a variety of ways to help His saints care for each other. Now He has blessed us with strengthened and unified quorums at the ward and stake levels. Quorums that work in coordination with all ward organizations. Municipal wards, companies, and strengthened quorums have all required at least two things to be successful in the Lord's intent to have His saints care for each other in the way He cares for them. They succeed when the saints feel the love of Christ for each other above their self-interest. The scriptures call it charity, the pure love of Christ. And they succeed when the Holy Ghost guides the caregiver to know what the Lord knows is best for the person that He is trying to help. Time after time in recent weeks, members of the Church have acted in my presence as, as if they somehow had anticipated what the Lord was going to do and has been announced here today. Let me give you just two examples. One, a simple sacrament meeting talk by a 14-year-old teacher in the Aaronic Priesthood who understands what priesthood holders can accomplish 
in their service for the Lord. Then the second story of Melchizedek priesthood holder who, with the love of Christ, was inspired to serve a family. First, let me give you the words of the young man speaking to a ward sacrament meeting. I was there. Try to remember what you were like when you were 14 years old and listened to hear him say more than so young a man could reasonably know. Quote, I've really liked being a member of the teacher's quorum in our ward since I turned 14 last year. A teacher still has all the responsibilities of a deacon, plus some new ones. Since some of us are teachers, others will be someday, and everyone in the church is blessed by the priesthood, so it's important to all of us to know more about the duties of a teacher. First of all, Doctrine and Covenants 2053 says the teacher's duty is to watch over the church always and be with and strengthen them. Next, Doctrine and Covenants 2054-55, this 14-year-old quoted these scriptures. I don't think he even had a note if I got it right. And see that there is no iniquity in the church, neither hardness with each other, neither lying, backbiting, nor evil speeding, speaking, and see that the church meet together often, and all see, so see that all the members do their duty. The young man continued, the Lord's telling us it's our responsibility to not only care for the church, but also care for the people within the church the way that Christ would, because this is his church. If we are trying to keep the commandments, be kind to each other, be honest, be good friends, and enjoy being together, then we would be able to have the Spirit with us and know what Heavenly Father wants us to do. If we don't, then we can't fulfill our calling. He went on to say, when a teacher chooses to set the right example by being a good home teacher, greeting the members at church, preparing the sacrament, helping at home, and being a peacemaker, he's choosing to honor his priesthood and fulfill his calling. Being a good teacher doesn't only mean being responsible when we are at church or at church activities. The Apostle Paul taught, be thou an example of the believers in word and conversation, in charity and spirit, in faith and purity. Then the young man said, no matter where we are or what we are doing, we can be a good example of righteousness at all times and in all places. He said, my dad and I home teach the Browns. Every time we go over there, I have a great time visiting and getting to know them. One thing I really like about the Browns is whenever we go over, they are willing to listen and they always have good stories to share. When we know people in the ward well because of home teaching, it makes it easier to do the next duty of a teacher, and that's greeting the members of church. Helping people feel welcome and included at church helps all the members of the ward feel loved and prepared to take the sacrament. After greeting members who have gone come to church, teachers help each Sunday by preparing the sacrament. I really enjoy passing and preparing the sacrament in this ward because everyone is so reverent. I always feel the Spirit when I prepare and pass the sacrament. It's a real blessing to me that I'm able to do it every Sunday. Some service, like passing the sacrament, is something people see and they think of, thank us for doing it. But other service, like preparing the sacrament, is usually done without anyone noticing. It isn't important if people see us serving. What's important is that the Lord knows we have served Him. As teachers, we should always try to strengthen the church, our friends and our family, by fulfilling our priesthood responsibilities. It's not always easy, but the Lord gives no commandments to us, save He shall prepare a way for us to accomplish the thing which He commandeth. As that young man concluded, I continued to be amazed and touched, as you can tell, at his maturity and wisdom. He summarized by saying, I know we will become better if we choose to follow Jesus Christ. Another story of priesthood service was told a month ago in a ward sacrament meeting. Again, I was there. In this case, the seasoned Melchizedek priesthood holder 
didn't know as he spoke that he was describing exactly what the Lord desires to happen with strengthened priesthood quorums. Here is the gist of his account, just not in his words. He and a home teaching companion were assigned to serve seven families. Almost all of them did not want visits. This may sound familiar to some of you. When the home teachers went to their apartments, they refused to answer the door. When they telephoned, they did not get an answer. When they left a message, the call was not returned. The senior companion finally resorted to a letter-writing ministry. He even began to use bright yellow envelopes in the hope of getting noticed and a response. One of the seven families was a less active single sister who had immigrated from Europe. She had two young children. After many attempts to contact her, he received a text message. She abruptly informed him that she was too busy to meet with home teachers. She had two jobs and was in the military as well. Her primary job was that of a police officer, and her career goal was to become a detective and then return to her native country and continue her work there. The home teacher never was able to visit with her in her home. <laughs> he periodically texted her. Every month, he sent a handwritten letter supplemented with holiday cards for each child. He received no response, but she knew who her home teachers were, how to contact them, and they would persist in their priesthood service. Then one day, he received an urgent text from her. She desperately needed help. She did not know who the bishop was, but she did know her home teachers. In a few days, she said she had to leave the state for a month-long military training exercise. She could not take her children with her. Her mother, who was going to care for her children, had just flown to Europe to care for her husband, who had a medical emergency. This less active single sister had enough money to buy a ticket to Europe for her youngest child, but not for her 12-year-old son, Eric. She asked her home teacher if he could find a good eldest family to take Eric in their home for the next 30 days. The home teacher texted back that he would do his best. He then contacted his priesthood leaders. The bishop, who is the presiding high priest, gave him approval to approach members of the ward council, including the Relief Society president. The Relief Society president quickly found four good families with children about Eric's age who would take him into their homes for a week at a time. Over the next month, these families fed Eric, found room for him in their already crowded apartments or small homes, took him on their previously planned summer family activities, brought him to church, included him in their family home evenings, and on and on. The families with boys Eric's age included him in their deacon's quorum meetings and activities. During this 30-day period, Eric was in church every Sunday for the first time in his life. After his mother came home from her training, Eric continued to attend church, usually with one of these four volunteer LDS families or others who had befriended him, including his mother's visiting teachers. In time, he was ordained a deacon and began passing the sacrament regularly. Now let us look into Eric's future. We will not be surprised if he becomes a leader in the church in his mother's home country when his family returns there, all because of saints who work together in unity under the direction of a bishop to serve out of charity in their hearts and with the power of the Holy Ghost. We know that charity is essential for us to be saved in the kingdom of God. Moroni wrote, except ye have charity, ye can in no wise be saved in the kingdom of God. We also know that charity is a gift bestowed upon us after all we can do. We must pray unto the Father with all the energy of heart that we may be filled with His love which He hath bestowed upon all who are true followers of His Son, Jesus Christ. It seems to me that we receive the Holy Spirit best when we are focused on serving others. That is why we have the priesthood responsibility to serve for the Savior. 
When we are engaged in service to others, we think less about ourselves, and the Holy Ghost can more readily come to us and help us in our lifelong quest to have the gift of charity bestowed upon us. I bear you my testimony that the Lord has already begun a great step forward in His plan for us to become even more inspired and charitable in our priesthood ministering service. I am grateful for His love, which He so generously gives us. I so testify and express this appreciation in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. My beloved brethren, we have heard a revelatory announcement from President Russell M. Nelson. We've heard important elaborations by Elders Christofferson and Rasband and by President Eyring. What will yet be said, including more from President Nelson, will elaborate what you, the Lord's leaders and priesthood holders, will now do in your responsibilities. To help with that, I will review some fundamental principles governing the priesthood you hold. The Melchizedek priesthood is the divine authority God has delegated to accomplish His work to bring to pass the eternal life of man. In 1829, it was conferred upon Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery by the Savior's apostles Peter, James, and John. It is sacred and powerful beyond our powers to describe. The keys of the priesthood are the powers to direct the exercise of priesthood authority. Thus, when the apostles conferred the Melchizedek priesthood upon Joseph and Oliver, they also gave them the keys to direct its exercise. But not all priesthood keys were conferred at that time. The entire keys and knowledge necessary for this dispensation of the fullness of times are given line upon line. Additional keys were given in the Kirtland Temple seven years later. These keys were given to direct priesthood authority in the additional assignments being given at that time, such as baptism for the dead. The Melchizedek priesthood is not a status or a label. It is a divine power held in trust to use for the benefit of God's work for His children. We should always remember that men who hold the priesthood are not the priesthood. It is not appropriate to refer to the priesthood and the women. We should refer to the holders of the priesthood and the women. Now let us consider what the Lord Jesus Christ expects from those who hold His priesthood how we are to bring souls unto Him. President Joseph F. Smith taught, quote, It has truly been said that the Church is perfectly organized. The only trouble is that these organizations are not fully alive to the obligations that rest upon them. When they become thoroughly acquainted to the requirements made of them, they will fulfill their duties more faithfully, and the work of the Lord will be all the stronger and more powerful and influential in the world." End of quote. President Smith also cautioned, the God-given titles of honor associated with the several offices in and orders of the holy priesthood are not to be used or considered as are the titles originated by man. They are not for adornment, nor are they expressive of mastership, but rather of appointment to humble service in the work of the one Master whom we profess or serve. Continuing the quote, 
We are laboring for the salvation of souls, and we should feel that this is the greatest duty devolving upon us. Therefore, we should feel willing to sacrifice everything, if need be, for the love of God, the salvation of men, and the triumph of the kingdom of God upon the earth." End of quote. In the Lord's Church, the offices in the Melchizedek priesthood have different functions. The Doctrine and Covenants refers to high priests as standing presidents or servants over different stakes scattered abroad. It refers to elders as standing ministers to my church. Here are other teachings on these separate functions. A high priest officiates and administers in spiritual things. Also, as President Joseph F. Smith taught, quote, Inasmuch as he has been ordained a high priest, he should feel that he is obliged to set an example before the old and young worthy of emulation and to place himself in a position to be a teacher of righteousness, not only by precept, but more particularly by example, giving to the younger ones the benefit of the experience of age and thus becoming individually a power in the midst of the community in which he dwells." End of quote. On the duties of an elder, Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve taught, quote, an elder is a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is commissioned to stand in the place and stead of his master in ministering to his fellow man. He is the Lord's agent. Elder McConkie criticized the idea that one is only an elder, quote, Every elder in the church holds as much priesthood as the president of the church, he said. What is an elder? He is a shepherd, a shepherd serving in the sheepfold of the good shepherd. End of quote. In this important function to minister in the sheepfold of the good shepherd, there is no distinction between the offices of high priest and elder in the Melchizedek priesthood. In the great section 107 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord declares, high priests after the order of Melchizedek priests, after the order of the Melchizedek priesthood, have a right to officiate in their own standing under the direction of the presidency in administering spiritual things, and also in the office of an elder or any office in the, Melchi in the Aaronic priesthood. The most important principle for all priesthood holders is the principle taught by the Book of Mormon prophet Jacob. After he and his brother Joseph were consecrated priests and teachers of the people, he declared, And we did magnify our office unto the Lord, taking upon us the responsibility answering the sins of the people upon our own heads if we did not teach them the word of God with all diligence. Brethren, our responsibilities as holders of the priesthood are serious matters. Other organizations can be satisfied with worldly standards of performance in delivering their messages and performing their other functions. But we who hold the priesthood of God have the divine power that even governs entrance into the celestial kingdom of God. We have the purpose and the responsibility the Lord defined in the revealed preface to the Doctrine and Covenants. We are to proclaim to the world that every man might speak in the name of God the Lord, even the Savior of the world that faith also might increase in the earth, that mine everlasting covenant might be established, that the fullness of my gospel might be proclaimed by the weak and the simple unto the ends of the world. To fulfill this divine charge, we must be faithful in magnifying our priesthood callings. 
and responsibilities. Elder Harold B. Lee explained what it means to magnify the priesthood. When one becomes a holder of the priesthood, he becomes an agent of the Lord. He should think of his calling as though he were on the Lord's errand. This is what it means to magnify the priesthood." End quote. Therefore, brethren, if the Lord himself were to ask you to help one of his sons or daughters, which he has done through his servants, would you do it? And if you did, would you act as his agent on the Lord's errand, relying on his promised help? Elder Lee had another teaching about magnifying the priesthood. When you hold a magnifying glass over something, it makes that thing look bigger than you could see it with the naked eye. That's a magnifying glass. Now, if anybody magnified their priesthood, that is, make it bigger than they first thought it was, and more important than anyone else thought it was, that is the way you magnify your priesthood." End of quote. Here's an example of a priesthood holder magnifying his priesthood responsibility. I heard this from Elder Jeffrey D. Erickson, my companion in a state conference in Idaho. As a young married elder, desperately poor and feeling unable to finish his last year of college, Jeffrey decided to drop out and accept an attractive job offer. A few days later, his elder quorum president came to his home. Quote, Do you understand the significance of the priesthood keys I hold? The elder quorum president asked. When Jeffrey said he did, the president told him that since hearing of his intention to drop out of college, the Lord had tormented him during sleepless nights to give Jeffrey this message. As your elders quorum president, I counsel you not to drop out of college. That is a message to you from the Lord. Jeffrey stayed in school. <laughs> Years later, I met him as a successful businessman and heard him tell an audience of priesthood holders, quote, that counsel has made all the difference in my life." End of quote. A priesthood holder magnified his priesthood and calling, and that made all the difference in the life of another child of God. Up to now, I've been speaking of the functions of the priesthood in the church. Now I will speak of priesthood in the family. I begin with keys. The principle that priesthood authority can only be exercised under the direction of the one who holds the keys for that function is fundamental in the church, but does not apply to the exercise of priesthood authority in the family. A father who holds the priesthood presides in his family by the authority of the priesthood he holds. He has no need to have the direction or approval of priesthood keys in order to counsel the members of his family, hold family meetings, give priesthood blessings to his wife and children, or to give healing blessings to family members or others. If fathers would magnify their priesthood in their own family, it would further the mission of the church as much as anything else they might do. Fathers who hold the Melchizedek priesthood should keep the commandments so they will have the power of the priesthood to give blessings to their family members. Fathers should also cultivate loving family relationships so that family members will want to ask their fathers for blessings. And parents should encourage more priesthood blessings in the family. Fathers, function as equal partners of your wives, as the family proclamation teaches. And fathers, when you are privileged to exercise the power and influence of your priesthood authority, do so by persuasion, 
by long-suffering, by gentleness and meekness, and by love unfeigned. That high standard for the exercise of priesthood authority is most important in the family. President Harold B. Lee gave this promise just after he became president of the church. Quote, Never is the power of the priesthood which you hold more wonderful than when there is a crisis in your home, a serious illness, or some great decision that has to be made. Vested in the power of the priesthood, which is the power of Almighty God, is the power to perform miracles if the Lord wills it so. But in order for us to use that priesthood, we must be worthy to exercise it. A failure to understand this principle is a failure to receive the blessings of holding that great priesthood." End of quote. My beloved brethren, the magnifying of the holy priesthood you hold is vital to the work of the Lord in your families and in your church callings. I testify of him whose priesthood it is. Through his atoning suffering and sacrifice and resurrection, all men and women have the assurance of immortality and the opportunity for eternal life. Each of us should be faithful and diligent in doing our part in this great work of God, our eternal Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Brethren, we are grateful for your attendance this evening. We likewise thank the choir for the inspiring music they have provided and acknowledge all those who have assisted in preparing for these proceedings in any way. The concluding speaker for this session will be President Russell M. Nelson, followed by the closing hymn, Rise Up, O Men of God, the benediction will then be offered by Elder K. Brett Natras of the Seventy. President. My beloved brethren, thank you for your devotion to the Lord and His holy work. It is truly a joy to be with you. As the new First Presidency, we thank you for your prayers for your sustaining efforts. We are grateful for your lives and for your service to the Lord. Your devotion to duty and your selfless service are just as important in your callings as ours are in our callings. Through a lifetime of service in this church, I have learned that it really doesn't matter where one serves. What the Lord cares about is how one serves. I express deep gratitude for President Thomas S. Monson, who was an example to me for more than 50 years, and for his counselors, President Henry B. Eyring and President Dieter F. Uchtdorf. I express profound admiration for them. I commend them for their service to the Lord and his prophets. Both of these devoted servants have received new assignments they continue to serve with vigor and commitment. I honor and love them both. It is a remarkable blessing to serve in the Lord's true and living Church with His authority and power. The restoration of the priesthood of God, including the keys of the priesthood, opens to worthy Latter-day Saints the greatest of all spiritual blessings. We see those blessings flowing to women, men, and children throughout the world. We see faithful women who understand the power inherent in their callings and in their in work in the endowment and other temple ordinances. These women know how to call upon the powers of heaven to protect and strengthen their husbands, children, 
and others they love. These are spiritually strong women who lead, teach, and minister fearlessly in their callings with the power and authority of God. How thankful I am for them. Likewise, we see faithful men who live up to their privileges as bearers of the priesthood. They lead and serve by sacrifice in the Lord's way with love, kindness, and patience. They bless, guide, protect, and strengthen others by the power of the priesthood they hold. They bring miracles to those they serve while they keep their own marriages and families safe. They shun evil and are mighty elders in Israel. I am most thankful for them. Now, may I voice a concern? It is this. Too many of our brothers and sisters do not fully understand the concept of priesthood power and authority. They act as though they would rather satisfy their own selfish desires and appetites than use the power of God to bless his children. I fear that too many of our brothers and sisters do not grasp the privileges that could be theirs. Some of our brethren, for example, act like they do not understand what the priesthood is and what it enables them to do. Let me give you some specific examples. Not long ago, I attended a sacrament meeting in which a new baby was to be given the name and a father's blessing. The young father held his precious infant in his arms, gave her a name, and then offered a beautiful prayer. But he did not give that child a blessing. That sweet baby girl got a name, but no blessing. That dear elder did not know the difference between a prayer and a priesthood blessing. With his priesthood authority and power, he could have blessed his infant, but he did not. I thought, what a missed opportunity. Let me cite some other examples. We know of brethren who set sisters apart as primary, young women or Relief Society leaders and teachers but fail to bless them, to bless them with the power to fulfill their callings. They give only admonitions and instructions. We see a worthy father who fails to give his wife and his children priesthood blessings, when that is exactly what they need. Priesthood power has been restored to this earth, and yet far too many brothers and sisters go through terrible trials insatiable trials in life without ever receiving a true priesthood blessing. What a tragedy. That's a tragedy that we can eliminate. Brethren, we hold the holy priesthood of God. We have his authority to bless his people. Just think of the remarkable assurance the Lord gave us when he said, whomsoever you bless, I will bless. It is our privilege to act in the name of Jesus Christ to bless God's children according to his will for them. Stake presidents and bishops, please ensure that every member of the quorums within your stewardship understands how to give a priesthood blessing, including the personal worthiness and spiritual preparation required to call fully upon the power of God. To all brethren holding the priesthood, I invite you to inspire members to keep their covenants. Fast and pray, study the scriptures, worship in the temple, and serve with faith as men and women of God. We can help all to see with the eye of faith that obedience and righteousness will draw them closer to Jesus Christ, allow them to enjoy the companionship of the Holy Ghost, and experience joy in life. A hallmark of the Lord's true and living church will always be an organized, directed effort to minister to individual children of God and their families. Because it is His church, we as His servants will minister 
to the one, just as he did. We will minister in his name, with his power and authority, and with his loving kindness. An experience I had more than 60 years ago in Boston taught me just how powerful the privilege of ministering one-on-one -on -one can be. I was then a resident surgeon at the Massachusetts General Hospital. On duty every day, every other night, and every other weekend. I had limited time for my wife, our four children, and church activity. Nonetheless, our branch president assigned me to visit the home of Wilbur and Leonora Cox with the hope that Brother Cox might come back into activity in the church. He and Leonora had been sealed in the temple, yet Wilbur had not participated for many years. My companion and I went to their home. As we entered, Sister Cox welcomed us warmly, but Brother Cox abruptly walked into another room and closed the door. I went to the closed door and knocked. <laughs> After a moment, I heard a muffled, come in. I opened the door to find Brother Cox sitting beside an array of amateur radio equipment. In that small room, he lit up a cigar. Clearly, my visit was not all that welcome. I gazed about the room with wonderment and said, Brother Cox, I've always wanted to learn more about amateur radio work. Would you be willing to teach me about it? I'm sorry I can't stay any longer tonight but could I come back another time? He hesitated for a moment and then said, yes. That was the beginning of what became a wonderful friendship. I returned and he taught me. I began to love and respect him. Through subsequent visits, the greatness of this man emerged. We became very good friends as did our dear eternal companions. Then, with the passage of time, our family moved away. Local leaders continued to nurture the Cox family. About eight years after that first visit, the Boston Stake was created. Can you guess who the first stake president was? Yes, Brother Cox. During subsequent years, he also served as a mission president and a temple president. Years later, I, as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve, was assigned to create a new stake in Sanpeet County, Utah. During the usual interviews, I was pleasantly surprised to encounter again my dear friend, Brother Cox. I felt impressed to call him as the new stake patriarch. After I ordained him, we embraced each other and wept. People in the room were wondering why these two grown men were crying. <laughs> but we knew, and Sister Cox knew. Ours were tears of joy we silently remembered the incredible journey of love and repentance that began more than 30 years ago, one night in their home. The account doesn't end there. Brother and Sister Cox's family grew to include three children, 20 grandchildren, and 54 great-grandchildren. Add to that their impact on hundreds of missionaries, on thousands more in the temple, and on hundreds more who received patriarchal blessings at the hands of Wilbur Cox, his and Leonora's influence will continue to ripple through many generations throughout the world. Experiences such as this with Wilbur and Leonora Cox occur every week, hopefully every day, within this church. Dedicated servants of the Lord Jesus Christ carry out his work with his power 
and authority. Brethren, there are doors we can open, priesthood blessings we can give, hearts we can heal, burdens we can lift, testimonies we can strengthen, lives we can save, and joy we can bring into the homes of the Latter-day Saints, all because we hold the priesthood of God. We are the men who have been called and prepared from the foundation of the world according to the foreknowledge of God on account of our exceeding faith to do this work. Tonight, I invite you literally to rise up with me in our great eternal brotherhood. When I name your priesthood office, please stand and remain standing. Deacons, please arise. Teachers, arise. Priests, bishops, elders, high priests, Patriarchs, Seventies, Apostles. Now, brethren, will you please remain standing and join with our chorus in singing all three verses of Rise Up, O Men of God. While you sing, think of your duty as God's mighty army to help prepare the world for the second coming of the Lord. This is our charge. This is our privilege. I so testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, we stand before thee with gratitude in our hearts for living prophets and apostles, for our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. Wilt thou bless and continually sustain him? We are grateful for thine only begotten Son for his infinite atonement. We pray that we might always remember him, that we will follow his example of love and service, that we will minister to all of thy children with love and devotion is our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. <laughs> 